days talked about my mission and my passion. And that is letting individuals and the corporations in which they reside realize their full innovation potential. Let me talk for a second about the origins of this mission. It started when I was in fourth grade. I was assigned a book report on Sir Francis Drake. The night before the report was due, I had not started it. But that was okay. The weather forecasters said that there was a big snowstorm that was coming in. So I was confident that I would wake up the next day, have the day off, and I could do the report then. I get up the next morning, predictably, there are two inches of snow on the ground. A two-hour delay is all I had. So I whipped out my pencil and quickly wrote what had to be the world's worst book report on Sir Francis Drake. A very kind teacher took pity on me didn't fail me, gave me a D. I brought that report home, showed it to my mother. Now stereotypes exist for a reason. My mother is from New York City, and she's a little bit of a firebrand. She was eerily quiet, probably even more scary than if she had started to yell. She said something that has stuck with me to this day. Scott, the biggest curse in the world is the curse of unfulfilled potential. I've come as I've gotten into my professional life to realize this is a big problem in the world today. The world of innovation is filled with unfulfilled potential. Let me tell you the first time that I encountered this problem personally. Let me introduce you to me in the mid-1990s. At the time, I was a sophomore at my college, Dartmouth College, a small school nestled in the middle of the state of New Hampshire. Now, when I was in my college, I was an economics major, and I took my studies seriously. But my true passion was the college newspaper, creatively enough titled The Dartmouth, covering all the hot happenings in Hanover, New Hampshire, a town that when school was in session had all of 10,000 people in it. But still, we took that job very seriously. The paper came out five days a week, Monday through Friday, mini tab, eight, 12, 16 pages. So I rose up ultimately to become the managing editor in charge of the new side of the paper. We were there when a transformation began in the media industry. During my sophomore, sophomore year, Netscape introduced the first commercial version of an internet browser, allowing lay people to access the World Wide Web. So there we were, a management team of this tiny little business faced with a transformation to our industry. What did we do? Well, first, we hesitated. We have a relatively small staff, and it wasn't high on our list of priorities. This explains why we were one of the last newspapers in our peer group to go on the internet. Why did we hesitate? The newspaper makes a substantial amount of revenues from subscriptions. We had a nice little business model at our newspaper, $250,000 US dollars a year, two thirds of which came from charging subscriptions. Our first feeling when we saw the internet was abject terror. We were worried that if we went online, we would destroy this model that we knew and loved. Well, we got over this fear, of course. After all, we were college students. It was the time in our life where we could do crazy, adventurous things. So Bryn and Paige from Stanford give the word Google, give the world Google. Zuckerberg from Harvard gives the world Facebook. Anthony, Simon, Cal, Edlick, and the rest of the team give the world, world a word-for-word, pixel-for-pixel replication of the print version of the newspaper online. Instead of saying, what can we do dramatically differently, we say, how will we find those people going through the web and get them to subscribe to the print version of the newspaper? Instead of choosing transformation, we chose to force fit this new technology into the lens of our existing business model. We chose to do things incrementally. We chose not to transform and go boldly into new spaces. Now, I've come to realize in the 20 years since then, and by the way, if you didn't figure it out, both those quotes were from me, from a 1995 article explaining our clearly brilliant internet strategy. I've learned in the years since then that this simple word that caused us to stumble, this word innovation, is something that many companies and many individuals stumble with. Let me give you a couple of brief statistics. 75%. That is the estimate of companies that are on today's S&P 500 index 
that export project will not be on that index in just 15 years. 80%. This is the percent of venture-backed startups that do not celebrate their third birthday. Now you might say that's just competition, that's just the way the world is. But think about what is lost as these organizations and individuals can't realize the potential they have within them. Too many people today believe innovation is a gift from above that only a few have. That is not right. Innovation is a discipline, it is a skill. It can be mastered, it can be managed. It starts with a simple definition. Here's how I define innovation, five words. Something different that has impact. That simple definition can help you to quickly highlight some misconceptions around innovation. Let me give you a case study of one of my favorite businesses in Singapore to show you these misconceptions. This case study involves me and my quest to find a good haircut. Now you might look at the results here, and you're laughing already, so you might look at the results here and you say, Scott, this is indeed a strange quest. But I had a problem back when I lived in the United States. I had two options, both of which were unappealing. The first option was to go to the local supercuts. It was decidedly not. It was incredibly affordable, $14.95 for a haircut, but it was so bad that reliably when I went home, my wife would point at me and she would start to laugh. The other alternative was to go to a fancy salon, pay $60, $70, $80 to get a haircut. The results were good, but I always felt guilty doing it. For these kind of results, that's clearly a waste of money. So I get to Singapore a couple of years ago. I'm talking about this problem with one of my colleagues. He says, ah, in Singapore you will be happy. For in Singapore we have a business called the QB House. Now, QB House only exists in Singapore, Japan, and legend has it there's one in Hong Kong. I've never seen it before. <laughs> so let me describe the business for those of you who don't know it. You want to have a haircut. You go to a kiosk like the one that's pictured here, or a store that's got two or three seats in it. You have a $10 note in your hand, not a two, five, or 15, because they make no change at the QB House. You put the note into a vending machine, you get a card, you sit in a seat. The seat has a sensor in it that's tied to a light outside of the kiosk, letting people know how long the wait is. When it's your turn, you give the card to the barber. I say all of three words to the barber. One, two, three. The length of blades to use in the three different parts of my head. The barber gets to work. I say not a single other word to them. I pull out my iPhone, or I look at the convenient television screen that's in front of me. Ten minutes later, they're done. My haircut always looks exactly the same. <laughs> Let me highlight two myths of innovation that this story helps to expose. First, there is a myth that innovation is the job of the white lab-coded R&D scientist. It lives in a laboratory. Only a few people do it. But what makes QB House innovative? Yes, there's a little bit of technology in it, but the reality is it's a different service delivery approach. Something different that has impact is the job of the many, not the job of the few. You can have new marketing approaches, new ways to organize, new internal processes. Everyone can and should be thinking about innovation. Second, think about what QB House does to deliver impact to me. A lot of people think that innovations are about big bangs, about great leaps forward in performance. But I watched in the audience, I saw some of you wrinkling your noses as I went through that QB House story. Through your own eyes, this looks like an inferior solution. You see, you have gifts that I don't have, which are beautiful sets of hair. For people like me who don't have those gifts, QB House is something different that has impact. Because it's simple, it's reliable. 10 minutes, just cut. That's its tagline, and it delivers against it every single time. It's not just the big bang. Sometimes it can be simplicity, accessibility, affordability that drives transformation. So how do you actually do it? Academics have been studying the field of innovation for decades. Practitioners have put many of these ideas to work. I simplify all of this by highlighting the four bases on innovation Mount Rushmore. Let me describe each of them for you. All the way on the left, you have A.G. Lapham the former chairman and chief executive officer of Procter & Gamble from 2000 to 2009. 
The reason why he's here is for a simple three-word mantra he drilled into the heads of everyone at Procter & Gamble. Consumer is boss. He told the organization and demonstrated through his action that everyone in the organization needed to shop alongside consumers, work alongside consumers, even live with consumers to understand them better than they understood themselves. Steve Jobs once said, it's not the customer's job to know what they want. Absolutely correct. It's your job. Living the consumer is boss mindset means radically increasing the amount of time we spend with customers. Now you might be thinking to yourself, I don't have a customer, but everybody has someone they're trying to serve. It might be a colleague, it might be a spouse, it might be a friend. Your goal is to burrow into their brain, experience the world the way they experience. Think about their hopes, dreams, and frustrations, so you can predict the things they want, but even if they can't articulate that. This line of thinking has been incredibly helpful to me in our consulting business. You see, it's very easy to get confused when you're a consultant. You think that what clients want are PowerPoint slides. So the more PowerPoint slides you give them, clearly the better you've done your job. But that's not what clients want at all. They might want an insight they were lacking. They might want to get into a business they're not currently in. They might want confidence around the decision they're facing. Those are the real jobs to be done. Lastly, in the consumerist boss mindset helps give you the inspiration for innovation. Picasso helps you translate that into an idea. The famous Spanish artist once said, good artists copy, great artists steal. A big mistake innovators make is they think that they get extra points for doing something that's never been done before, or doing something really difficult. Remember, something different that has impact. The scoreboard is measured by impact. If you follow Picasso's advice, you can short circuit the distance between inspiration and a compelling idea. It's really quite simple. You frame a problem, then you find the person in the world who has already solved it. They might be in a different industry, they might be in a different country, they might be in a different company, but you find them, you learn from them, and you apply it to the problem you're trying to solve. Then you got to follow the advice from Mike Tyson. The legendary American boxer and occasional philosopher once said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> this is the reality of innovation. There is no such thing as a perfect plan. The best businesses emerge out of a process of trial and error experimentation. Go back to science class. Come up with a hypothesis. Develop an experiment to test that hypothesis. Run that experiment. Learn from the results, paying attention most carefully to the things you didn't expect. Innovation Mount Rushmore came out of this process. A couple years ago, I was to present to a large group in 15 minutes some of the key thoughts I had around innovation. I said, impossible. Like a good consultant, I had 120 slides on the topic. As I was looking at the slides, I realized there were four key points. Four, four, four. What else has four things? Innovation Mount Rushmore came into my mind. I quickly fired off emails to four separate designers. We got four separate prototypes. I showed those to my team. We picked the one we liked the best. We showed it to the audience, and we continued to iterate. In fact, Innovation Mount Rushmore underwent some significant renovations this year as Pablo Picasso's face got added. I'll mention the fourth face that was on it in just a minute. The final face that appears on this version is probably the one that's least familiar to you. This is my grandfather, Robert N. Anthony Sr. He's there for a life lesson he taught me when I was all of seven years old. You might think it's about a good work ethic or respecting one's elders, but it's actually an accounting lesson. Piece of context. My grandfather is a member of the Accounting Hall of Fame. It's a real place. In his career, he wrote 30 separate books on accounting. So there I was as a seven-year-old going through the computer version of his most popular book, Essentials of Accounting. Staring out at me is the first principle of accounting, the dual aspect concept. Everything balances out. Every debit has a corresponding credit. Every asset has a claim against it. Everything that makes you strong makes you weak. Everything you're good at determines what you're bad at. Don't make the mistake of treating innovation as a solo activity. The best innovations are done in groups, intentionally in diverse groups. 
So start by developing a real inventory of what your strengths and weaknesses are. Be honest. If you ask people if they're above average drivers, 90% of them will say yes. Statistically, it's impossible, but that's the way your brain works. Once you identify your weaknesses, find people who can augment your strengths and push you in different directions. Who's the Wozniak to your jobs, the Jobs to your Wozniak, the Sandberg to your Zuckerberg? Find the person who can complement you, is different from you, and pushes you in a different direction. This, again, is where innovation Mount Rushmore came from. I could dream it, but I could not do it because I have no design skills at all. But I know people who are designers, and I know people who know people who are designers. What I hope is that by sharing these four simple mindsets, I will help the future version of me more successfully confront their innovation challenges when they're running whatever will replace newspapers 20 or 30 years from now. Let me end by giving you one final piece of advice. The fourth face that used to be on Innovation Mount Rushmore was Thomas Alva Edison. He was there for a lot of reasons, but primarily for his quote, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. To do something different that has impact, you have to do something. Let me give you a simple analogy. Last year, my now six-year-old son, Charlie, decided he wanted to learn to ride a bike. We could read all we wanted on the subject. We could watch every YouTube video about it. But Charlie knew nothing about riding a bike until he got on the bike and began to pedal, and fell down, and got up again. Today, Charlie is a competent bike rider. He can get from point A to point B without too much difficulty. Whether he becomes Lance Armstrong, I don't know. But if he keeps practicing, he can become a skilled bike rider. Just like if you keep practicing, you can become a skilled innovator. So get on your darn bike. Thank you and good luck.